approaching meditation as deep pleasure and relaxation is very much like getting a massage. And for this reason, actually getting massage once in a while is really good for all meditators. Sutra 16. The roar of joy that set the worlds in motion is reverberating in your body and the space between all bodies. Find that exuberant vibration humming in your secret places, streaming through the channels of delight, rising new in every moment. Know you are flooded by it always. Beloved, listen. The ocean of sound is inviting you into its spacious embrace, calling you home. Float with the sound. Melt with it into divine silence. The sacred power of space will carry you into the dancing, radiant emptiness that is the source of it all. That is just Sutra 16, one of the many gorgeous poems in Lauren Roche's Radiance Sutras, which is a loose-ish translation of the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, and it's a whole story of love. I'll read you another one. 51. Svarupa. Wherever, whenever you feel carried away, rejoicing in every breath, there, there is your meditation hall. Cherish these times of absorption, rocking the baby in the silence of the night, pouring water into a crystal glass, tending the logs in a crackling fire, sharing a meal with a circle of friends. Embrace these pleasures and know, this is my true body. Nowhere is more holy than this. Right here in the sacred pilgrimage. Live in alertness for such a moment, my beloved, as if it were your one meeting with the Creator. But one meeting, a million meetings, a quadrillion meetings, what do you have over the course of your lifetime? And over the course of a single day, if we were to slow down enough to integrate and process and feel into and extrapolate and make the connections from just the things we encounter in a single day, our lives would change. So these qualities of poetry, tantric attention to detail, these are the kinds of things Lauren brings into his meditation teaching. So when I first encountered his methodology, which is called instinctive meditation, it really sounded to me like a very different modality than the kind of sit still and concentrate version of meditation that has been normalized. So I'm very excited to share with you this interview with Lauren Roche where we get into the impossible challenges of living in a human body, the incredible paradoxes and things we have to deal with and how meditation can help us defrag our nervous system and how meditation is not what you've been sold, but a much broader uh, experience, a rich and diverse and radiant experience to participate in. We also get a little bit into cancel culture as one of those impossible challenges of being in a body and many more applied benefits of doing a meditative practice. We start by talking about the impact of meditation. When you learn how to meditate, it becomes like an almost like an instant vacation, a healing spa. Basically, the idea of having a daily meditation practice is that you learn how to just with the breath enter your favorite ten thousand dollar a day healing spa where you're being massaged, you're getting an Ayurvedic treatment or a acupuncture, you're listening to the greatest most mind-melting, heart-melting music. You're seeing beautiful colors. And we all, we deserve this. This is what meditation is. It's giving your body, mind, heart system permission to enter the state of healing and renewal and regeneration. That's what all the shouting is about over the last couple thousand years. That's what the meditation teachers have been saying is that, hey, human beings, your nervous system is a miracle and it can recreate any experience that you desire. And you deserve this. Like just to be able to have a good day 
we need to have like a half an hour in the morning to be in our own personal divine healing spa, just to tune up all of our nerves and senses so that we can be at our best. I love that you're framing it this way, like this delightful, sensational, internal reset versus how I think it's been taught by a lot of people, which is discipline, sit down, do nothing, hold your spine upright, you know, like an imposition on the system. This is a very, this sounds like a very different view. Yeah. Well, if you approach meditation as an indulgence in your heart's deepest craving and a sensual delight, then you could sit in Zen, you could sit rigidly still being with one thought or just being with your breath because you're bringing your whole self to that practice. So from the outside, meditation could look that way. Now, one of the challenges of, of talking about meditation is that it's an internal asana flow. Meditation, when it is internal, and so we can't see much about what a person is experiencing inside. Like if we look at those statues of the Buddha, where it's sitting cross-legged and there's that beatific smile. That's a point in Buddha's development where he looks that way. And anybody, even a, a wildly passionate Broadway dancer, say someone whose whole life is acting out the passions in live on stage in theater. And if they meditate, they would look just like Buddha for a few minutes. Even, even when they're processing how they feel about their love life, they might look just completely quiet and beatific as if they're sit that way forever. If we took a photo, so it's just an external appearance. Inwardly in meditation, the whole skill set is to welcome all of the energies of life. And what we welcome can become transmuted, weaving together all of the energies into the fabric of our existence. And this is a an artistic challenge. We're all like artists in the studio with, with millions of different colors, materials, canvases, whatever our medium is. We're all faced with the artistic challenge of how do I create a day for myself today? And we all have a series of dozens of impossible challenges. Like you have to be, say you're at work, with other people, you have to be crisp and professional and yet also, you know, breathe and maintain yourself and, and stay alive. And you have to be clinical and distant from everybody because any romantic liaisons at work just lead to catastrophe. But at the same time, people spend most of their time at work. And so where are people going to meet their mate? Really, where do people meet? Like historically, where do people meet the love of their life? Well, it's often they might show up at work. So then how do you do that? Like, do you both quit then quit? We have to keep our passion alive and yet be cold and distant as if we sprayed Windex on everything and clean, uh, scrubbed everything clean. And so we're all faced with this series of impossible challenges all day long, whatever, and having kids. Yeah, a woman has a child and then you grow this, you say to life, okay, grow another human being in my body. And then your whole body changes into this unrecognizable other thing, a woman pregnant and then lactating and then nursing. And then the child goes away and uh, thanks for all the sandwiches. Don't call me, I'll call you. So then we adapt. To that. So life is always giving us a series of impossible challenges. And in meditation, what the purpose of meditation is to welcome all of our impossible challenges. And then to use a chakra metaphor that your, your um, people are probably aware of, that there's these centers of wisdom and instinctive energy everywhere in the body. Give your body a chance to line up all of your different forms of intelligence, or we have many. If you think of the chakra model, or just think of the different kind of intelligence, 
we have like street smarts to some extent and survival instinct. We have gut instincts and we'll have erotic intelligence, sexual intelligence, intelligence about how to use power. We have adoring intelligence or love relatedness, social empathetic intelligence. We have maybe intuitive intelligence. And so we have as if different brains, we have different centers in our, in the pelvis, verbal intelligence, the ability to articulate what you're feeling, thinking, seeing. Meditation is a time and place and skill set for letting all of our forms of intelligence get their ducks in a row, so to speak, coordinate to support you in dealing with whatever your life challenges are. And this process is wild. Meditation, if you interview people who have a deep, thriving meditation practice, it's every emotion. It's like a movie. It's like a absorbing movie or a novel. There's this thrill of facing the challenges and then the pain of being alive and then the bliss of the way that the life force is always healing us. So meditation is a wild experience at the same time that it's very serene. I like how you wove in there this idea of crafting your day as a work of art and um, sort of taking all of the experiences you have and then meeting them with your full resource self. So when you're in the practice, are you consciously summoning these centers or are you more doing uh, an integration? You can, and there's times when we need to summon them um, just to open up that channel of communication. It's different for each person, but it might be that for three days you say, okay, I'm actively summoning my sexual intelligence, my uh, street smarts, like the sense that maybe like those guys or women that I'm attracted to bad boys. Like I know that like sexually I'm attracted to a, like a bad boy or a mischief maker or somebody that's embodying the shadow. Only two days a month. <laughs> <laughs> right, two days a month. And then we think with the second, with a different brain. And I know that person, um, they might be fun to think about or see in a movie or flirt with, but really expensive. Like they can wreck your life in half an hour. And so, um, and women in particular have to think that way because women can get pregnant. We can say for a while, like, okay, I'm actively summoning my sexual intelligence, my emotional intelligence, my social relational intelligence, my cunning, like my ability to see around corners, my female intuition or, or hunting instincts, my protective instincts, my boundary setting intelligence, and let's all together work out a game plan. Though it's a team, any human being is an inner team of many different kinds of intelligence. And in a quiet moment, they all tend to come. So facing our challenges by default automatically invokes our inner resources. And this is the plot of every movie you've ever seen. We're all in that same boat all the time, every day. Life is always asking us to do impossible things. First of all, I just want to like reiterate that sweetly phrased point that every novel's or every movie's plot is about waking up your inner resources in the face of challenge. Often, the, the instruction is kind of get on your cushion and sit there and it'll all work out. But you're articulating a very intentional planning like a summoning process for these different centers that might last a few days, might be just for that day. So in crafting your your practice for the day or the week or what what's up in your this current stage of your life, what does that look like from a preparation standpoint? This is one of those cases where someone's looking from the outside and said, oh, that's what it is. The mind boggles at how dumb it is. Just for example, take the phrase, watch the breath. So watch, what, is, what does watch the breath mean? Well, imply watching is seeing, right? So it's in your mind's eye, watch the breath. So watching the breath is the most boring approach to breathing that there could possibly be. <laughs> it's not really there in, 
in the Sanskrit literature, the idea of watching the breath. What Buddha is reported to have said is things like breathing in sensitive to rapture, breathing out sensitive to rapture. Think about that. That's I'm doing it right now. If you're listening, breathe in sensitive to rapture. Sensitive to rapture. So with breathing, there's smell because it's been through the nose or the mouth. There's the temperature. We can sense temperature. Like the, if you breathe in through your nose and then breathe out slowly through your mouth or breathe out through your mouth onto your hand, you can feel the heat because the breath has been, go ahead, Christine, breathe out slowly onto your hand. Mm. Mm. The breath flowing out is hot and moist from being in your body for a couple seconds. So there's temperature, there's touch, there's a touch of breath, there's expansion. Our whole body, or at least the, the rib cage, the, it expands a bit as we breathe in and contracts as we breathe out. So there's all this motion. It's very sensual. It's sensual. There's a massage quality to it. So it's as if the person who made up this phrase, watch the breath, was afraid of sensuality. So it's, there's a lot of Puritan impulses in the meditation jargon. This denial of the body, denial of sexuality, fear, fear of sexuality and emotion. Um, so watch the breath. It's practicing detachment and that can be useful. You know, it's a possible medical intervention. Like in your medicine cabinet, you might have like, what is that stuff that you paint on a wound? It's what is it, purple or brown, like iodine? Iodine, or, beta, betadine. Yeah, so in your medicine kit, you might have a detachment meditation, but very few Westerners need a detachment meditation. Like, we're already so detached. That's, you know, like what you were describing about being at the office, going through that life in a bubble of protection and boundary. Um, last night I was talking at a dinner on intimacy, and – you know, it's a lot of wonderful young people in their 30s, and they speak to this of like this isolation and loneliness and not being, not knowing how to relate. Not knowing how. And there's a lot of bad things in the old world, like bullying, mm. or, or, or the, have been downtrended in many ways. But bullying, it comes back in some ways worse. Bullying is striking back, and there's a lot of bullying on the internet in the name of political correctness, but younger people not being able to be in the rough and tumble ever the slightest thing can be judged and canceled. Just the slightest thing can invoke this severe response. Right now, it's almost all men that are being universally condemned, but the tide will turn and then it'll be women. In order to be not in judgmental and to be sort of a compassionate listener, a tolerant person, a person who wants to grow and grow with the community, that takes a certain skill set of sitting in discomfort and also an environment which trusts that if you were ever to do something wrong, that you would be received in the same way. So like cultivating that feels really vital. Yeah. So this is one of the impossible challenges that we all face. Like in some ways, like with sort of the internet, and, and political correctness, in some ways, we're sort of living in a Puritan village in the year 1700. It's like any year old girl can have a dream and say, in my dream, that uh, the widow over there, that unmarried woman over there, that she was dancing with the devil, then the whole, all life in the village comes to a halt. And everyone, they have an inquisition, and they basically torture that woman until she confesses that, yeah, she's in league with the devil. And if she doesn't confess, then you just keep on torturing her. We're all sort of living in um, that medieval village. And what was that novel, The Scarlet Letter? And it turns out that the woman was pregnant by the preacher who's always preaching against sex. And that's the whole meaning of The Scarlet Letter. The people who are preaching against something, that are often the worst offenders. So we're like, we're all living in it. So there's, in a sense, there's nothing new. Bullying to destroy somebody's reputation and cancel them. 
So it's the same as high school. It's the same as junior high school. It's the same as a street gang. And we all have to navigate these things. So what is meditation then? In meditation, it's a place to feel the challenges of life because they'll come. And so when we realize this, there is no mind wandering. Whatever we think during meditation is just like the dishes to be done. It's just the, the items on our to-do list and our challenges that we need to be with. And meditation, generally we want to make meditation feel as luxurious as possible, as easy and effortless as possible, because that's the most effective way to set up the situation for our healing. The, here's the paradox, is that the more we relax in meditation, the more that what we're tense about can come to the surface to be felt and healed. That's, that's it. Why if people listen to me, it sounds like I'm promoting a luxurious, self-indulgent, spa, massage-like approach to meditation. And that's because that's what works. That's how the body works. We heal by accessing safety and relaxation. And in meditation, we learn to give ourselves that perfect safety. And then when you approach it this way, then the whole outer world is your ally. Movies that you love and novels are, and plays and theater are, are your allies because it's the story of a human being facing her challenges and then summoning the resources to deal with that. And therapy is your ally because if you have a therapist or a consultant or a coach or a dance teacher or a voice teacher, and you get the sense of how they're paying attention to you and what they're guiding you into, meditation becomes like an inner, a continuation of your therapy. From any of these profound encounters we have with the psychotherapist of any kind, which could be body therapy, voice therapy, art therapy, music therapy, um, movement, there's many amazing healers using many different models. It could even be like something like archery and riding horse, dressage, riding horses. Like you could learn a lot about meditation from being with horses. Like, and like dressage is I think more sophisticated than almost any meditation instruction. Is that because of the level of awareness and attention to detail it requires? Yeah, because in dressage, say, which is this incredibly skilled way of being with horses, because it's external and visible and you can see it, they develop the language, whereas meditation is so invisible because it's just inside of a person that there's always a struggle to talk about, to describe anything. But for example, if I listen to horse people, their language and their description of technique is much more refreshing than most meditation instructions. Now, the, the Radiant Sutras, what I call the Radiant Sutras, which is this, the Vinyana Bhairava Tantra, it's completely enthusiastic about life. It's just like, all right, you're a human being, you're in a body, you can enter through any doorway or an ordinary breath, the sense of wonder, in awe or astonished or in love or scared or angry or overcome with lust or hunger, hungry or sneezing, um, running from a danger, running from battle, um, wistful, like longing, longing for home, missing someone that you love and it, loving them from a distance is thinking wistfully of someone you love, remembering a kiss, or in the middle of sex, or at the height of orgasm, or at the afterglow, or being at a party, wandering in nature, the, the Bhairava Tantra describes all of these as doorways into meditation. So that's the way I was trained starting in the 60s. It's been 54 years now, and it's just a love affair with this approach, with this with this text, which is one of the traditions of meditation. It's just for people who live in the world. Most, most meditation teachings come from monks, people that gave up the world 
And so their techniques are somewhat different. There's a denial because literally the definition of a monk is I renounce my ego, like I die to my old self. I won't even remember what my name used to be. I get a new spiritual name. I, I give up all my money. I give away everything. I, if I have anything, I give it utterly to the, to the ashram. And I give up my personal will, like my to-do list. I only do what I'm told. I take an oath to follow orders unquestioningly. Those are the three vows that are gener generally constitute what being a monk or a nun is. It's, it's uh, poverty, obedience. What is it? Celibacy. Oh yeah, and celibacy. I never have sex, never have a personal relationship, kill, off, kill the desire to be touched, even kill that, like, that skin hunger, that desire to have a friend. Like you can't even have friends. So the path of being a monk is wonderful for people who dharma it is to be a monk or a nun it's a path it's a path of death or basically whatever age you are you go through the process of death like you will when you die from this body and uh, i love those people but it's just a different path from being in the world and having having to make money having a home having friends having to do something about sexuality um either to live it or deny it making your own choices it's a completely different pathway and so they speak completely different like for example for people who live in the world you need a strong supple ego the ego is that in you which knows what you want so that you and also can set boundaries what i don't want that's not appropriate that toxic for me like in an ashram you just eat whatever slop they throw on your plate and that's it. There is no choice about what to eat. You don't, you can't say, no, I don't want to eat that. I'm vegan. You just eat whatever slop gets thrown in your plate, like being in the military. You've, you made a vow to give up your personal choice. So in a person who lives in a world, we have to get to know our body, what our body needs, our emotions, our heart. It's a tremendous creative challenge every single day. And it can be thrilling when we give ourselves deluxe, luscious meditation time. It's such a profound retreat. Like I, I lived outdoors in Hawaii for over nine months in the most incredible place, just swimming every day, recovering from working with homeless people and um, many of whom are mentally ill and, schizophrenics and and it was so painful and exhausting so i i just needed to be outdoors and uh so i've lived outdoors and i grew up at the beach my mother was a surfer raised five kids on the beach in southern california in the 40s and 50s so i've known a great deal of luxury and even so if i meditate for half an hour in the morning it's all so much more intensely enjoyable, the activation of all of the senses. It's much more of a deluxe feeling, like sort of like having no money and having access to meditation. It's richer than having millions of dollars and not being in the true flow of your own personal Shakti, your own energy is kind of a form of instant wealth and instant vacation. Now the ordeal side, the challenge of meditation is that the more you relax, the more and the quicker your, your pain will come up to be healed. Approaching meditation as deep pleasure and relaxation is very much like getting a massage. And for this reason, actually getting massage once in a while is really good for all meditators because Say you have a really good physical therapist or massage therapist, they'll approach your body slowly until you really relax. Until once you really trust their hands, their, their hands will find their way to your sore spots and they'll start like digging around in your sore tissues. And you won't believe how much pain is there in certain muscles and nerves and tissues. And we have, we all have this instinct 
once we're truly at ease, like, oh, ouch. No, don't stop. Like, ow, 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 ow. <laughs> I'm having a somatic response to that, by the way. <laughs> Sympathetic response. So it's very similar. Like in massage, the more that you trust the hands of your massage therapist, the more you'll let them into the places in you that really, really hurt. And so this is a great teaching. And so this is why you want your meditation practice to be completely luxurious is so that you, you have created a safe space for your feelings of unsafety to rise to the surface, to be healed. That's, that's how it works. So you're sitting, you're sitting there and, and this, you made some quiet space. It's luxurious. You're letting, and these feelings begin to come up. The things that have been wanting to off gas and be investigated or allowed. What do you do in that moment to avoid like clenching and pulling away as it's arising? Well, you will, you will pull away. And so this is where the skill of meditation comes in. Cause there's, there's thousands of little skills that you learn of being with yourself. And this is where, um, short-term therapy can help. And also great conversations with a friend. Like there are people in the world that can be any age. It could be grandmother type people who love the human story. And you can tell them anything. Um, there is a problem for psychotherapists or clinical practitioners in that they have to evaluate you according to the DSM, or they might think they have to. And so they'll tend to pathologize. But that's very useful in certain circumstances also, because they might have danger um, signals. But in general, inside of yourself, unless necessary, you don't want to pathologize anything. You. Yeah, and we're constantly learning how to meet all of the energies inside. I think it's a lifelong process where, that we're always getting better at. So we learn as we go. What you want is for your initial approach to meditation to be healthy enough that you're not just canceling yourself out. And for this reason, for it's sort of generally true, like the as a stereotype, it's better to approach meditation through music and dancing and say poetry and then, and say dance and listen to music for 10 minutes. And then if you feel like it, lie down or sit to meditate. Does that discharge the physical tension or move the energy before you lay down or sit? Yeah. Well, think about the songs you love. Like so many songs actually feel like heartache. What they've done, what they do is they'll take a painful feeling and turn it into beauty. Mm. Do you like popular songs at all? Or would it, have you listened to anything lately? I was listening to Nina Simone's best last night where she start. you know, she's like feeling good is her top song. It's got like 350 million plays on Spotify or something. And she's talking about like all the things that make her feel free, but underneath it, it's coming out of this like acknowledgement of all the times you're not free. You know, that it, it's like the tension between the longing of like, here, I'm feeling good, but it's like, I'm feeling good in this moment, as opposed to all the others when I'm not, you know, it's, a, it's, and, and, oh, 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 oh. she's like, Phew, you know, like your whole body comes alive with it. That's exactly it. That's not new, but. That tension and meditation is a sublime place for embracing that tension. The word Tantra has one of the meanings is tension. It means weaving, mm. that there are strings under tension, like the strings of a guitar. And it the tension in the strings of a guitar or violin or piano that let them resonate. So tension is a great thing. Tension is music. Tension is weaving. Our word attention, there's a reason why the word tension is in attention. It's where ten and also tender. So it, in meditation, we're tenderly allowing our attention to be called to the tension that we are in. And what happens is that even though it's painful, like in the song you're describing in the performance, that there's an interplay of unfreedom and the soul crushing qualities of interacting with the outer world, and then the liberation, the appreciation of freedom. 
and hard won freedom. So that's what's there in her in her song, and we all have that. Mm. Lauren, I I love the way you're the way you're speaking about meditation. I think there's a piece in here that was around the strong and flexible ego, um, like cultivating that versus trying to abnegate the whole egoic process, and that that in an in, in a life where you're interacting with the world, that is actually your ally. You're not trying to kill it. That piece is in a lot of ascendant spiritual theologies and a lot of the yoga world and a lot, you know, someone told me the other day that it's really easy to govern a people who see suffering as the path to enlightenment. And it's very difficult to govern a people who see joy as the path to enlightenment. And that there's this desire to see people deny the body, deny the ego, because that's really a painful place to rest, to be in constant combat with the reality of embodiment. So I like that you're offering a different perspective. If you think about the problems facing the spiritual supervisor who has, say, an ashram, say it's a year 1,000, and they have like 500 people there, a bunch of them were given to the ashram as children because the parents were starving, some of them may have been sold to the ashram to be used as sex slaves. Uh, some may have been, maybe when they were 10 or 11, they came out as asexual, like they didn't want to go for the arranged marriage. Everybody was in an arranged marriage. Then so they ran away from home. And then there might be a bunch of old men from who knows where. So you have a thousand people or 500 people of this mixed you have, and they have to live as monks. And as so a society is warehousing these people over there, we'll feed you like the farmers will bring food by every day. But it's like you just, just shut up and sit still. Yeah, so that's not a calling. That's not like I'm summoned to, you know, be a conduit, like half embodied conduit to the divine on behalf of the planet. That's like an, an orphanage situation. There's a every there's orphanage and mental asylum. Wow. A halfway house for people who didn't know who they were, but they fled from the arranged marriage. And, you know, back before modern medicine, most babies would die. A lot of babies died. Look up the statistics. You know, it wasn't uncommon for women to have 10 kids and all of them but three would die in childhood. So I think some of the monks, they watched their mother give birth to all these babies who then just who died and then the mother died give in childbirth and this i don't want anything to do with this like i don't i'm just terrified of getting a woman pregnant like they mm. think about children who saw baby after baby sibling after sibling die mm. and then the mother died childbirth that's like survivor's guilt too yeah that wouldn't cure anybody of wanting to get married so there's those people, and we don't know much about the the whole scene. There are hints from in China and Japan, they would talk more about these things. And, and some of them were spiritual geniuses and society was supporting them or at least feed, bring food to their cave so they could go inside and do all this research. And so we have just millions of, of text of, of, sutras and and mantras and and texts about this whole inner inner work but it was like if you think about the ashrams of the past each one is different but there's just innumerable reasons why someone might become a nun or a monk you call your practice instinctive meditation right I call it instinctive meditation yeah for many years i wouldn't even give it a label because with each person i like to listen to them I don't do this so much anymore. I've been involved in training meditation teachers. After teaching meditation from 1970 to 75, and where I would just teach a technique, I started listening to people where people would come and I would just listen to them for a couple hours. And, you know, tell me about what do you long for? What are your natural meditative experiences? And then what I found with that when it, person would just describe to me their natural meditative experiences. 
that they would put together their own practice. Like, for example, there's these incredible people. Everybody has these incredible moments. Like this woman said, like, I take my dog for a walk and then they get to sleep on the sofa. There's a sofa they're allowed to sleep on. And after their sleep, I'll come in and I'll just watch them breathe. And this other woman would watch her kids sleeping and have, and just stand there in rapture, having the most profound communion with the life force. Like this is, this is God or the goddess. Like I am in communion with the goddess. Right now. And one day I visited my sister. It was an afternoon. And, and I said, Danielle, you look like you've been meditating. You're just a glow. There's just, there's a, a ball of light shining in all directions from, from you said me meditate like are you kidding like she this is her third child and the baby was a couple months old forget exactly how many months maybe less than six months and so she's a working mom said me meditate she's like laughing i said yeah you've had you've had a meditation experience today i can tell you're just you're glowing in the way that only meditators or people in love glow and i said when he says well actually she says actually i got up at two in the morning to feed the baby and and then i sat holding the baby for half an hour after he'd fed to, to make sure that he's deep asleep and she said it was uh it's summer so all the windows were open and i could hear in all directions i could hear the whole neighborhood and the quiet rustling of the trees and the breeze. So when you think about it, she's sitting on the sofa, feet on the ground, holding the baby in her arms with that posture. And she's just been gushing with love, literally feeding the baby from her body. And she went into Samadhi. She dissolved into oneness. She traveled through the path of love through gushing, what is more like the liquid of love than the mother breast milk feeding the baby? And she went into profound meditation from that. And in Samadhi, there's no other, it's just all oneness. So she wasn't asleep. She glowed exactly like one does after Samadhi from being completely at one with the life force. You know, when you're speaking that, like... um you said earlier in the conversation how we can recall any profound mystical experience we've had. We, it's a reference point in our body, uh, songs and whatever. And as you're speaking your sister's experience, I'm literally sitting in the rocking chair with my fourth child where, I mean, that was like a, a those middle of the night feedings were the only time where there was spaciousness to expand and rest and feel the love flowing without distraction. And uh, it was a profound meditation, such a beautiful acknowledgement. Um, I'm so moved by that. Yeah, I just spent the last 54 years listening to women, mostly. <laughs> the demographic is two-thirds women and one-third men since I started meditating and doing yoga in 1968. Yeah, Camille, my partner and I, we wrote a book, Meditation Secrets for Women, that was published by Harper and also the Radiant Sutras, it's based to a great extent on listening to women describe these natural samadhi experiences and also men. Probably everybody has experiences like this. And one of the purposes of meditation is to be a place where they can amplify and continue to unfold. Well, instinctive meditation, Lauren Roche, this is just a taste of the work that he and Camille have done and what they're offering. Uh, I know there are some free downloads on your site for people who want to begin to explore uh, this modality, which is body positive, joyful, pleasure and pain oriented, where it's like a con you're, you're really getting into the pleasure of, you know, releasing the things that are making your life feel heavy like looking at them, the challenges. There's so much beautiful content in there. And then, of course, the book, The Radiant Sutras, which is like poetry in inspiration. This translation is so beautiful. 
Would you like to invite people to some entry points and how they might find out more about your work? Yeah, just type laurenroche.com, L-O-R-I-N, Roche, R-O-C-H-E. You'll find me. And come be trained as a meditation teacher. It's a good way to learn enough about meditation to construct your own practice that makes you thrive. In order to meditate and really be healthy, you really, you need, we all need to be able to embrace all parts of ourselves, all of our emotions, all of our instincts. And, and this is the challenge that we all face every single day. <laughs> Even after 54 years, I just consider myself a pretty good student because <laughs> it's life. There is no mastery of life. It's we want to be a good student. We want to be on our path. Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Lauren Roche, laurenroche.com, L-O-R-I-N-R-O-C-H-E.com. You can sign up for his meditation teacher training, which is great, even if you don't intend to teach, just to drop in and get to know your own practice. Have a look at his partner, Camille's work with women, and also take a look at his beautiful book, The Radiant Sutras. So whatever you're doing in your meditation practice, in your meditative surfing, meditative dishwashing, meditative baby nursing, whatever you're doing, may you find that deep, powerful, centered peace that enables you to love your life and serve the world in the best way possible. You can find me on Instagram at the.rose.woman and my company, Rosebud Woman at Rosebud Woman or rosewoman.com. We make gorgeous, beautiful body products, intimate wellness products, supplements to help you live an optimal life, and a lot of limited edition, pretty cool things like our brand new pink clay and Himalayan sea salt body soap and these beautiful selenite dishes that are hand curated from a beautiful supplier in India. So, all love all blessings. Until next time.